Ladies and gentlemen, I know that in this room we have businesses in environmental technologies and services worth over £120 billion with over a million employees. So a sector that continues to demonstrate how it's possible to deliver both for the economy and the environment. We want to continue to support your growth through clear policy direction, investment, and support for new businesses, simplica simplification of regulations, and removing unnecessary burdens. We're working with businesses to deliver an industry strategy that will generate economic growth and create jobs. Renewable energy, including the offshore wind industries, are supported by our sector strategies that create business confidence, investment, and growth. The Green Investment Bank is operational with 3.8 billion pounds of funding to invest in sustainable projects. SMEs have been provided with more than two and a half billion, uh, as well as business advice, regulatory simplification and tax relief. Environmental industries perform strongly. We recognize and value the sector's crucial role in ensuring that more and more of the benefits of a green economy are recognized. This is helping us as a country deliver the highest economic growth in Europe because, as we all know, a healthy environment is vital for a healthy economy. And we've addressed environmental challenges to regenerate land, to use energy and resources efficiently and responsibly, to reduce the amount of waste that's produced and to move towards a more circular economy. Air quality, despite what one reads in the paper, has improved significantly. Back background concentrations of particulates and nitrogen oxides halved in the 20 years up to 2012, and average roadside concentrations of nitrogen dioxide levels have fallen by nearly 15% since 2010. But we all know about the infraction proceedings, so more clearly needs to be done. Indeed, we face a huge challenge meeting EU limits for nitrogen dioxide, and we're working to revise our air quality plans to ensure compliance as quickly as possible. Key to this will be ensuring diesel vehicles meet emission standards when driven in the real world. We're working with the Commission to rectify this problem. Air quality is vital for healthy communities, for plants, and for wildlife. And that's why, since 2011, we've committed very substantial sums to support the uptake of transport solutions that will improve air quality. Money's been made available this year to local authorities to support the delivery of air quality objectives, including uh, low emission strategies, behavior change programs, green schemes, and more cost-effective measures to improve air quality, to raise awareness and meet the challenge of complying with nitrogen dioxide limits. We've also consulted on changing the local air quality management system, which has been in operation since 1997, but has as yet failed to deliver to the extent that our ambitions and requirements demand. We want better targeting of air quality measures at the local level as well as to simplify the regulation and reporting requirements. A regulatory and guidance consultation is due shortly and will invite discussion on the proposed options for change. The Environmental Industries Commission, world leading experts, people in this room, have worked with us in the reuse and regeneration of contaminated and derelict land, providing sustainable development and economic benefit. The UK environmental industry can and should be a major player across the globe. Uh, and I acknowledge once again the efforts made by the EIC, particularly in China, helping UK businesses improve the environment on the other side of the world and at the same time grow our economy. I think it's worth re-emphasizing the UK's pragmatic, risk-based approach to regeneration of contaminated land. It promotes the use of brownfield sites, and indeed we have one of the highest brownfield recycling rates in Europe. This is 
an important achievement, and we need to continue to ensure that sustainable remediation underpins this sector. As one of our key stakeholders, the EIC have worked closely with us during the recent review of statutory guidance, which has led to quicker decision-making and savings to businesses. We published new screening levels for contaminated land earlier this year, and as these bed in, I ask you to work together to ensure that they're applied consistently and comprehensively. These could provide real benefits to the sector and to those affected by land contamination. I welcome the fact that industry proactively offers up solutions to problems you encounter. I'm pleased that the Land Forum, of which the EIC is a member, is working to develop a quality mark which should help improve the consistency and quality of work across the sector, uh, which is a great example of cooperation between industry and regulators with the ultimate aim of easing burdens on those companies that are doing the right thing. Through the National Planning Policy Framework, uh, we are fully supportive of the Green Belt. The framework makes it clear that Green Belt boundaries should only be altered under exceptional circumstances. So since 2010, we have abolished top-down regional strategies, sold surplus brownfield land for redevelopment, and introduced more flexible planning rights so that empty buildings are brought back to productive use. The most recent official statistics show that development in these green lungs around towns and cities is at its lowest uh, since uh, records began in 1989. We've also acted to ensure that energy is acquired as sustainably as possible, that the UK has energy security, and to support businesses with their energy costs. The 2014 budget announced a £7 billion package of support for energy costs for businesses and measures to ensure that the difference in the price of carbon between the UK and Europe won't rise above £18. We're supporting renewable, efficient energy through actions such as electricity market reform, whilst also protecting businesses from the costs of the renewable obligation and feed-in tariffs to 2020. Actions to develop renewable energy further include an exemption to the carbon price floor for electricity from good quality combined heat and power plants and investment in and development of renewable energy technologies. There are around 7,000 jobs in the offshore wind sector and the offshore renewable energy catapult opened for business in June 2013. £235 million will be available for less established technologies, £155 million for projects commissioning from 2016-17, and a further £80 million uh, for 2017-18, which is an £80 million increase on the indicative budget, which was announced in July. The total value of the levy control framework for supporting low-carbon electricity investment remains £7.6 billion in 2020. 21. There's a healthy pipeline of offshore wind development, and we've set out a package which can deliver a range of 8 to 15 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2020. In addition to these energy sources, shale gas could be a significant contributor to UK growth and energy security. In utilising our natural resources, we're clear that extraction must be safe, sustainable, and conducted in an environmentally sound way, we will not dilute environmental standards. In June 2012, the Royal Society and Royal Academy of Engineering report on hydraulic fracturing concluded that environmental and health and safety risks can be managed effectively in the UK, provided that operational best practices are implemented and enforced. We have a strong regulatory regime for shale gas exploratory activities and robust regulations are in place. And we will continually look to improve our regulatory regime as the shale gas industry develops. Much of this underpins our efforts to tackle the challenge of climate change. Uh, and it's worth remembering that carbon emissions are 27% less than in 1990 and have seen a 6% improvement since 2010. As I mentioned earlier, a key priority is to boost growth 
in the economy while continuing to protect and improve the environment. Encouraging a more sustainable approach to resource use and management is a major factor. It's essential that our economy values used products and the materials that they contain. We're serious about making the UK economy sustainable and resource efficient. We want to move away from the model of make, use, dispose. I don't need to tell you that this circular economy is one that keeps resources in circulation and respects the environment, economy and society. It is essential for our future growth, for increased resilience and for environmental and human health. Improved technology and innovation makes the move towards a circular economy possible. Many UK businesses are leading the way by reducing their environmental impact through greater resource efficiency, productivity and innovation. Through our action-based research program, we're funding uh, over a million's worth of projects, working with business groups, researchers and civil society to find new solutions and better understanding of the barriers to improving resource efficiency. Improving our efficiency includes improving our knowledge and ensuring that the right skills are available. And that's why we're funding a pilot project led by the Environment and Sustainability Partnership in partnership with Bangor University, the manufacturers organization EEF, and Rolls-Royce. Uh, and this partnership is trialing a shared resource efficiency manager model that will support clusters of SMEs along the Rolls-Royce supply chain and in the southwest. Through Innovate UK, we've also been supporting businesses on research and development to address circular economy challenges. The Great Recovery Programme of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacture and Commerce is bringing together groups across the supply chain to address design and other challenges to make a circular economy a reality. Resource efficiency includes reducing the amount of waste that we produce and treating the waste that does arise in the most sustainable manner. Our first approach must be to prevent waste in the first place. The Waste Prevention Programme for England was published in 2013 and has a key role in moving towards a more sustainable economy through prevention of excess waste. Voluntary agreements with the food, retail and manufacturing sectors, hospitality and food services sectors, as well as the Love Food Hate Waste Programme, have been successful in reducing annual household food waste by 1.3 million tonnes since 2007. And we're committed to a further 5% reduction of household food waste and 3% of supply chain food waste by 2015. The amount of household waste recycled, composted or reused, is almost four times what it was in the year 2000, an achievement that reflects a lot of hard work by waste companies uh, and local authorities and the desire of householders to do the right thing. By working together, local authorities, waste companies, industry and householders, we can promote good practice in recycling and make it more convenient for householders to recycle. I'm aware that separate collection of the four different types of recyclate, paper, metal, plastic and glass, will become the default collection system from January uh, 2015. This is to achieve the quality needed for reprocessing, but it doesn't mean we'll need dozens of bins. And where separate collections are not practicable, then commingling and sorting at uh, materials re recovery facilities will still be possible, provided quality can be maintained. Where waste cannot be prevented or recycled, then we must ensure that we manage it wisely. Uh, and this includes recovering energy in the most efficient and environmentally sustainable way, including recovering both electricity and heat from energy from waste facilities and utilizing technologies such as AD. Disposal uh, should be the option of last resort and setting landfill tax at the appropriate level and ensuring that it'll, it'll increase in line with inflation has contributed to greater utilization of more sustainable waste management options. Unfortunately, not everyone abides by the law, and it's essential that robust action is taken to enforce the rules that are in place to protect our environment. Illegal waste practices 
have the potential to affect all of us by damaging our environment and undercutting legitimate businesses. We take this very seriously, and that's why in this year's budget, a further £5 million of funding was allocated to actions that will reduce waste crime. The global market for environmental goods and services is projecting strong growth, and this presents an opportunity for export. Our support for innovation and best practice in this sector at home is closely linked to our efforts to promote what we're doing on the global stage. We're working with UKTI to explore export opportunities for British environmental businesses, to contribute to our wider 2020 export drive, and we're particularly interested in the water, waste and resources sectors. We're keen to expand our knowledge and understanding of the strengths of British businesses in the global marketplace, as well as your views on the scale of the opportunity, your aspirations for export, and the actions you're taking to make them a reality. So uh, we recognize, welcome, and will continue to support the significant contribution that the environmental industries sector is making to a healthy UK environment and economy. All the evidence points to the continued innovation and growth of UK businesses in this sector, both at home and globally. Thank you very much. Um, I'm told the Minister needs to leave uh, bang on uh, 20 past for um, parliamentary duties and the like. So uh, if I, we only have time for five minutes of questions, so we're going to take two or three very, very quick questions, and we, they must be short and sharp. Um, we've got many people asking questions. Sorry, the gentleman uh, here, in, if you could just make it short and sharp, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I, I've got a question uh, which um, stems from my experience uh, and working with the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health, uh, who, uh, whose members are the, reg the local authority regulators who look after contaminated land. Um, one of the issues, the, the issue really that I, I, I'd like a comment on from you, if, if I may, if I may ask, is, um, is what, what is your, what is your uh, opinion of the, the new screening values that you mentioned? Um, when uh, uh, one must realize that, that there are only a handful of them that have been developed. They are uh, significantly higher than the minimal risk values that are traditionally used by, uh, by the regulators and by the, by the developers, which we've been happy with for quite a long time. Um, and uh, the, uh, the trouble is that the, that the uh, uh, adoption of, of, of of these values or values, similar values for other contaminants uh, developed in the future will actually lead to a significant reduction in the level of protection of human health for all residents uh, who, who um, will li live in all any future developments that are, that are uh, approved under, this, under this new, this, these new regulations. So I'd, I'd like a comment on that. Yes. Um, well, you will appreciate that we spent a lot of time thinking through these things very carefully. Um, they are still precautionary, but they are pragmatic. They are thoroughly evidence-based, and they were uh, properly peer-reviewed. Uh, and I am confident that they will not present uh, a risk to human health. Uh, yes. Uh, Lord de Morley, hi. Charles Perry. I was up there um, just before this session. Um, and we did a poll, and I think it might interest you to know that um, over 99% of the people in this room scored the coalition less than five marks out of 10 on their performance on greenest government ever. Now, brave speech and very eloquent. I congratulate you on that. But are you interested in the feedback as to why over 99% in this room score you less than five out of 10? Sure. Would you not? <laughs> <laughs> Let me, I mean, let me phrase that in a different way. Um, I'm, I'm, happy, are, are you, are, I'm happy to I'm yeah. happy to give a few reasons, but I think... No, no, well, in, the interest, in the interest of time, just a, a very quick journalist question. Are you concerned that the um, impressive agenda that you sketched out on green performance of the government and indeed the Conservative Party is undermined at all by things like the Conservative Party plans to ban onshore wind from the next election or Owen Paterson saying if he had his time again, he would tear up the Climate Change Act. 
Does that undermine the progress that's been made? No. I mean, a, a political party is full of uh, people coming from all sorts of angles. Uh, you may not have noticed, but Owen Patterson is no longer my Secretary of State. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> having said that, um, uh, I mean, I, I think there is a, a, a tension between um, the use of land. I mean, you, you, you mentioned onshore wind, but there's also um, uh, the, the use of land for generating solar energy. Um, those sorts of things, we think, I mean, we, we're, they're not making any more land, and uh, we have also to think about things like growing enough crops to feed our, our um, population. Um, I, uh, I mean, a lot of work has been done on this, and I am satisfied that there are, that we can generate solar energy from roofs and other places rather than using agricultural land, um, and similar th considerations apply to onshore wind. And are you concerned at all that maybe you feel you're not getting credit with the green community? Sounds like it, for? yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to ask one last very quick question. Um, the lady here has a hand up. If you could very short and sweet, that would be fantastic. Okay. First of all, I have given evidence where I've had conservative politicians who have listened attentively and I have felt they have actually done something about what I said. So I want to start off with a positive point. Cool. And the question is... Are you going to tear up the Climate Change Act if you go into the, get into government? Uh, of course not. 